You're watching We On World Is One. My name is Eric Njoka. Today, we are talking about the Russia-Ukraine war as 2023 comes to an end. Neither side has made significant gains this year, and analysts say Russia and Ukraine lack resources to mount any serious offensive for now. There's a new development. The Netherlands is set to deliver 18 F-16 fighter jets to Kiev. Denmark, Norway, and Belgium have also announced they will give F-16 jets to Ukraine after the U.S. government approved sending them to defend against Russia as soon as pilot training is completed. So, what next for Ukraine and for that matter, Russia? Let's now talk to Glenn Deason, the professor of international relations, University of Southeastern Norway. Professor Glenn is joining us from Oslo. Thank you for making time for us and welcome to We on Wild is One. Uh, thanks for having me on. <clears throat> Let's start with the latest, Professor. EU states delivering some fighter jets to US in aid to Ukraine. Who will fly these planes? Because the pilots in Ukraine are still under training, so sending the jets now will look like giving recruits or what we are calling rookies a heavy job. And how long will the planes even take to reach Ukraine? Well, it's a bit unclear because uh, the, the planes have to be ready, the training has to be ready, and uh, also um, they, they need uh, to actual ways to protect these planes as well because Russia will probably go after them very quickly as soon as they arrive. So uh, it, it's unclear. It's, uh, it's both a political decision as, as, a, as well as a technical one. So it's really yeah, difficult to predict. But uh, because the Ukrainian defensive lines are collapsing, I think they will want to get them in as soon as possible. What's the ultimate impact of supplying Ukraine with weapons, in your own view? Uh, well, the F-16s, I think uh, NATO keeps looking for this uh, uh, wonder weapon, something that will help to turn the war around, some game changer. I, I don't think the F-16 will be that weapon. Uh, however, they will, I guess, contribute to es escalating because uh, uh, keep in mind that last year, uh, President Biden said that he wouldn't send F-16s because that would be a good way to start World War III. So obviously everyone recognizes this is a huge escalation. And uh, and now there's also talks about the F-16s probably ta uh, maybe taking off from NATO bases within uh, yeah, NATO countries uh, to attack Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's the case, then uh, Russia has responded they will become legitimate targets and they would uh, they would strike these NATO bases, uh, which is a possibility because uh, the way they see it, the price of inaction would be too high. So uh, it, it will definitely contribute to escalate the conflict, but uh, they will, I guess they will have minor impact on the battlefield uh, uh, simply because uh, a, a lot of the supportive systems have already been weakened. Professor, do you think this is a way of Europe stepping up by replenishing U.S. stockpiles? Uh, definitely. I think this is a way to try to keep uh, the war going a bit. Because uh, I noticed in the introduction you said that uh, there's been no uh, significant gain. And I would agree in terms of territory. But one has to remember that this is a war of attrition in terms of exhausting the enemy. So I think the, one of the reasons for sending the F-16 is the European sees as uh, necessary to step up because uh, you know, about 80% of casualties are caused by artillery, and Russia absolutely dominates with many more times artillery and ammunition, and the NATO has largely run out of its artillery shells. So we also see that Russia tends to dominate with armored vehicles, fighter jets, helicopters, drones, seven to ten times more drones, according to the Ukrainians. It dominates with missiles, air defense, electronic warfare systems. So in every single measurable indicator, Russia dominates. So as a result of this, we see horrific casualty rates in which for every Russian uh, who falls, there's seven to ten Ukrainians who are lost. So, mm -hmm. uh, and this is only increasing more, and we see more and more Ukrainians surrendering, deserting. So I think the F-16s would have two functions. One would be a morality boost for the Ukrainians as things are going from bad to worse. But it would also, of course, it would have an impact on the battlefield, but uh, not, not significant to the extent uh, NATO is hoping to defeat Russia. Professor, skeptics of aiding Ukraine argue that the U.S. is committing itself to pumping billions of dollars into a war that has settled into a stalemate with no end in sight. What do you make of that statement? 
No, I, I think that's uh, correct. As I mentioned, this is a war of attrition. The, the Ukrainians are losing uh, all of their equipment and all of their manpower, and um, and they're not making much gains. Uh, indeed, it's the Russians who have been, over the past few years, building up a huge stockpile of weaponry, mobilized hundreds of thousands of soldiers. So uh, the, the, the war has already been lost from the from my perspective. But, uh, of course, by pulling the political uh, support and economic support, it makes uh, matters worse as well, because now the Ukrainians are not only losing militarily, but they're also losing, uh, you know, diplomatically with their support from the West. Mm -hmm. So as, as a result of this, uh, we see, of course, this uh, growing divisions within Ukraine, because uh, they want to see who's to blame for losing the war and, you know, how do they respond to this uh, situation. So we see divisions from between the political leadership, so Zelensky and the military leadership, which would be led by Solushny. And also a lot of these far-right uh, fascist groups, which uh, were previously more aligned with the, uh, with the government, they become more fiercely opposed to any course correction. So uh, I, think, I think there's good reason in the West to be critical, because this, this war can't be won. But uh, that being said, pulling the support is uh, hastening the, the collapse in Ukraine. Professor, let's now talk about what you call this war of attrition. Last few weeks... It felt like Ukraine was left in the lurch after the U.S. Republicans blocked further military aid for Ukraine and Hungary's leader, Viktor Orban, wanting to veto a comprehensive EU aid package. Some experts pointing towards troops' morale waning in the battlefield. Do you also believe that rising Ukraine war fatigue could endanger U.S. and, US and the EU support? Oh, well, I think definitely, because you see uh, within Ukraine as well, the support for the war is declining. Uh, the popularity of Zelensky is declining. So, and uh, again, as they're under military pressure, they have to improve some uh, other areas of society. But instead, it's becoming worse. So, uh, as they're losing now, uh, Zelensky is talking about they need 20,000 new soldiers every month just to replace their losses. That's 20,000. And overall, he's asking for half a million soldiers to be recruited. Now, when he says recruited, we're far beyond anyone volunteering. So they're pulling people off the street. They're now recruiting women, minors, elderly. And uh, of course, this, this has huge consequences. Uh, the quality of the soldiers drop, of course, and you know they're less reliable. Uh, but what it also does is it causes growing opposition within the population. So if you go through the, the Ukrainian telegram channels, you see a huge... Uh, your concern now about uh, you know their young men being pulled off uh, the streets on their way to work to be dragged off to the trenches. Uh, mm -hmm. So so there's a fatigue. They notice that they're now because Russia's gone on the offensive. So now they're losing territory as well as having lost some so much of their men and uh, of course their cities are being built. So they're in such a horrible situation now. Uh, the morality is definitely dropping. Russia has reacted. The Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia has warned that it will react robustly to Western moves to seize its assets or deploy missiles. Moscow could sever diplomatic relations with the United States should it confiscate uh, Russian assets, assets frozen under sanctions. What's the significance of this latest development from Russia? Well, it also shows that, uh, you know, this proxy war is not only fought on the battlefield, it's also an economic proxy war. And, uh, of course, the, it was quite dramatic when uh, uh, when the, uh, the West froze all these assets. Some put the number on $300 billion worth of Russian assets, others have put it on less. But they already started to seize, the Europeans at least seize, uh, the, the profits of these assets. So they're already effectively stealing money from the uh, Russians. Uh, so this is quite dramatic. Of course, one can make a moral argument, uh, given that Russia invaded Ukraine, that, you know, they, they should send mon Russian money to rebuild. Uh, but with that logic, you know, the whole world sh could seize American assets to give to the Iraqis. So, so this is just uh, a complete collapse of uh, rules and international law. Mm -hmm. This has never been done before. So it, I think it will contribute to eroding the trust in the Western uh, financial systems. But, uh, but of course, the, we also have to look at the Russian response. They have a lot of Western assets that they can seize as well. And, uh, you know, it's... Um, 
it, I think it's going to be a, a huge mistake to escalate in this direction, mm -hmm. uh, simply because the West's reputation will fall apart, and of course the Russians will respond in kind. All right. Finally, Professor, President Zelensky has ruled out talks with Russia as long as Putin remains in power and said that there had been no requests from Moscow for talks. Your prediction of 2024 as far as the war is concerned? Well, actually, Zelensky made it law not to negotiate with Russia. So he had uh, make, made it a law not, not, not to even talk to them. So I think that uh, it, it will probably be the other way around, that uh, as the West and the uh, Ukrainian military sees a need to talk with Russia, uh, they would have to get rid of Zelensky because, you know, he's, he's quite uh, ex uh, yeah, extreme on, on no negotiations. But uh, from my perspective, what to expect in 2024 is I think this war will be wrapped up before summer, probably. Of course, one doesn't have a crystal ball. But the problem here is uh, it was a war of attrition. Ukraine has been completely exhausted. It doesn't have the manpower, the equipment. The West, which has been funding this war, uh, no longer has the, the ammunition or even the political will to support. And as a result, after the enemy has been uh, weakened, that's when you go on defensive. And that's what Russia is doing now. They're, they're going across uh, offensive across the entire front line. So now they will begin to seize territory, and you will see the situation, I guess, in Ukraine go from bad to worse and uh, collapse uh, within the next six, six months. Of course, one should be careful to make these uh, predictions, but uh, that seems to be the direction we're currently going at. I've been talking to Glenn Deesen, who's a professor of international relations, University of Southeastern Norway. Thank you very much, Professor, for talking to us today. Uh, my pleasure. We On is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.